I can't tell you the number of times as a pastor that I've shared Psalm 23, sitting with parents who've lost a child. A bad report from the doctor, stage four cancer. Prodigal children that have made horrible, awful, bad choices and decisions. The milieu of issues. I've often read and quoted Psalm 23. This text is often quoted by chaplains, believe it or not, who are leading inmates to their execution. Psalm 23. It's an incredible psalm. So if you have a Bible, a tablet, or an extraordinary memory, uh, turn to Psalm, Psalm 23. I'm just going to walk through the psalm. There's some portions of Scripture that you mess them up with over-explanation, and this is one of them. It is powerfully poetic. It's a major message here. But the psalm begins with a thesis statement. A declaration. The psalm begins, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I think we need to park there for a minute and marinate in that statement. Sometimes when we're familiar with stuff, we'll go, okay, we'll get on to the next one. I know what that means. No, let's just sit there for a minute. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd couple of observations in your Bible or on your app or tablet, the word Lord should be written in all caps. And if it's not written in all caps, you know, download another version. <laughs> it's all caps. And the, the significance of that, and I don't mean to get granular here, but this is very important. The significance of that is that that is the Hebrew word uh, commonly translated Jehovah, but technically speaking, there's no such word as Jehovah. That's just phonetically um, put together. It's an abbreviation. The closest we get in Hebrew is, uh, I guess you could pronounce it Yahweh. It was the unspeakable name. The scribes would not write that name out. And the reason why they would not write that name out is that it was a particular name of God. Um, the other dominant name of God is Elohim, which has to do with the summation of all that God is. But this word, Yahweh, it's the name of God where God condescends to identify with the human predicament. Where he steps down and, and, and he walks among us. He identifies with me. And the scribe says, that's unspeakable. And David is saying, the Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. Now think about that. All of the attributes of God are at your disposal. He is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He never changes. He's everywhere at once. All that he has is with you. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, uh, implicit in that statement, though, is dependence and surrender. Quoting Psalm 23 without surrender to the shepherd means categorically absolutely nothing. You have just quoted words. Implicit in this statement, when David says, the Lord is my, is my shepherd, means that I've submitted to his lordship. He is my shepherd. Now, the promise is this, or the conclusion is, therefore, I shall not want, and the Hebrew is stronger than that, therefore, I shall not lack anything. Why? Because he has everything. It's not my adequacy, it's his sufficiency. He is my shepherd. Now, based upon that, David goes on to declare, because he is my shepherd, I, I have four dominant realities, four dominant experiences. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. Well, what happens? Well, first of all, I experience comfort. Comfort. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. These pictures here, because he is my shepherd, he, he directs my life. He leads me <laughs> and makes me lie down in green pastures. That's the picture of lush abundance. Food that will not hurt me. It nourishes me. This is where he leads me. He leads me to abundance. He feeds me. He resources me. He gives me what I need. Now, again, you have to keep in mind, it's because I've made him my shepherd. He's not one among many shepherds in my life. He is. He alone is my shepherd. Because he's my shepherd, he feeds me. He feeds me. He gives me exactly what I, I need and what, 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 what's good for me. Then he says, he leads me beside still waters. That could have been translated, he leads me beside waters of rest. Uh, one of the things in my study of the text here that I, I, I didn't realize this, that, you know, sheep are easily spooked. They're jittery. And sheep will not drink from quickly flowing waters. It scares them. And so what does he do? He leads me besides calm waters of rest. And he tells me to drink deeply. And I want to encourage you over this Christmas break, over this Christmas holiday, take some time to drink deeply. Stop. Stop. Let him, let him refresh you. Put your phone down. Stop with the texting. Shut down the internet. Let him refresh you. Our barrenness often is our own fault. This is where he leads you. Quit running from his, his leading. And he restores my soul. I think the picture here, the lush food, the quiet, still streams, brings restoration to me. He restores my soul. Then after he does that, he leads me in paths of righteousness. An alternative rendering is that he leads me in right paths. He leads me from refreshment, from strength, from nourishment to right paths. To right paths. You got to slow down in order to get to where you need to be faster. Did you hear what I just said? It's counterintuitive. You have to stop and receive in order to get to where you need to be. Clarity is the product of worship and reverence. You have to declutter your head in order to hear clearly what God has to say to you. And the longer you walk with God, the less volume he's going to use to speak to you. He's not going to raise his voice. Crawford, 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 Crawford. Put the phone down. Let me restore your soul. Yahweh, Yahweh is my shepherd. And because he's my shepherd, I experience comfort. But the second reality, the second experience that I, that I have is because Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord himself, God, would dare come to me. I experience his protection. 
It says here in verse, verse 4, even though, contrast. The contrast here is first you have serenity in, here in verses 2 and 3, and now you have threat. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I, uh, I've been to Israel. We, when I was pastoring, every, every other year, every two years, we lead a study tour to Israel. So I can't tell you I've been to Israel number, numbers of times. However, this past spring, I was uh, helping to lead a tour uh, with, uh, from Moody, Moody Bible Institute to Israel. And I had never heard this before. All my trips, I never heard this before. We were coming up from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the guide said, as we were on the bus, he said, uh, if you look quickly to your left, this is known as the valley of the shadow of death. I never knew that it was a literal place. He says, many scholars believe that this is what David was referring to. And as I glanced at that, I said, I very well could be. It was a ravine uh, with thick uh, you know, growth and this kind of thing where predators can hang out. And this is what David is referring to. Now, the Psalms are not written sequentially, and so I don't know exactly where this comes chronologically in the life of David. Maybe this takes place during that time in which uh, he ran from Saul for 16 years hiding out in the wilderness. And David knew about being chased. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, some of you are right there right now. You are scared spitless. There are issues in your life. There, there's stuff that's going on inside of you. you, you you're, you're afraid of tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen next week. Some of you are afraid to go home for the holidays. <laughs> you got family issues. You got stuff going on. There's all kinds of threat in your life. And yet this text says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why do I not fear evil? Listen to the words. For you are with me. Who is with me? Yahweh, the Lord, is my shepherd. Not some inspirational piece that you read this morning, but who's with you? The first person, the first person, the first person person of the Trinity, God himself, is with you. So you have his presence. Then he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You not only have your, his presence, but with his presence comes his resources. You understand me? God's, God's deliverance is not theoretical. He says, your rod, the rod was used to drive predators away. And God never misses a lick. And your staff, what was the staff used for? The shepherd's crook. It was used to, to pull you out of bad situations. You, you, you know, you look like you're going to fall off the cliff and he grabs you. I not only protect you from your predators, but I protect you from yourself. I protect you from you. My biggest enemy has always been this idiot right here. <laughs> and so what does he provide for you? Yahweh, the Lord, is my shepherd. He provides comfort for me. Secondly, he provides protection for me. This psalm is like a, a great piece of classical music. The central theme of the music is the opening line. Yahweh is my shepherd. He's the center of my comfort. Yahweh is my shepherd. He's the center of my protection. But he's, grand, he's going toward this grand crescendo. Not only does he give me this reality and this experience of comfort and this reality and experience of protection, but dare I say, number three, he gives me this reality this experience of honor and favor. Oh, listen to these words. This is unspeakable. He says, you, who? Yahweh. 
you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about that. Opposition is no hindrance to God's favor in your life. Did you hear what I just said? Stop empowering people. Circumstances. David writes this, and I, 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 I can't prove it, but this has shades of his, 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 his running from Saul. And David says, you know, they keep shooting at me, but you keep favoring me. They keep lying about me, but you keep honoring me. You, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about that picture. It's a huge banquet. And this is dais up front. And you're the only person sitting at the dais. And your enemies have got to watch you. You have all the food. They don't even have hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> you, you prepare, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Then you anoint my head with oil. Oil is a symbol in the Old Testament of two things. It's a symbol of selection, singular selection, set apart. But it's also a, it's also a symbol of empowerment, the Holy Spirit's hand on you. And I'm standing there in front of all of them, and you just keep drenching me with oil. Then he says... My cup overflows. Sometimes we read stuff like that in the Bible. We think, well, he's just being poetic there, and it I don't, doesn't mean anything. It's just nice. No, no, it means I'm, I'm indebted to Ray Vandal and the noted Hebrew scholar for this observation. Back during this time when you were at a banquet or a, special, a feast or something, uh, there was this tradition. When it came time to go, the, the, you know, your host would tell the servers, um, only fill up the chalice, only fill up their chalices a third, maybe half of the way there. And that was a polite way of saying, you ain't got to go home, but you got to get out of here. <laughs> okay, the party's over, right? It's over. Okay, see ya. But if they really liked you, if they really liked you, what the host would do is say, hey, you, you, you see that guy over there? Yeah, that, 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 that David over there. He would continue to pour until the wine would just keep flowing over the edges and you're standing in a puddle. And it was like, I really like you. I really like you. I really like you. And the word picture's there. I'm standing there and I'm the only one with the chalice. I'm standing in a puddle because Yahweh himself says, I really like you. Some of you listening to me have, are having a hard time with that statement. You know why you are? Because you're likening God uh, to your, and I please forgive me, I, I'm, I'm too old to do recreational speaking. You're likening God to your dysfunctional father. You're projecting on God, you know, uh, neglect, uh, abuse, uh, uh, detachment, and all this other kind of stuff. You got to stop that. God is nothing like your imperfect dad. Isaiah chapter 49 says, God says, I've got you engraved in the palms of my hands. I'm always looking at you. I love you, yes, and I like you. You're in my fold. 
You're my sheep. I'll leave the 99 to come after you, Crawford. My honor and favor is on your life. Now, honor and favor does not mean, does not mean that you're going to be comfortable all the time and does not mean that, you know, you're going to be protected from trials and this, all of that because on your way to doing something, you've got to become something and you've got to experience the grace and favor of God even through dark times, but it means that his hand's on you and you're in, invincible until it's time for you to come home. He loves you. He loves you. You, he's your shepherd. He's your shepherd. Yahweh is my shepherd. What does he do for me? I, he kisses me his comfort. He kisses me his protection. And this takes my breath away. I don't deserve his favor. I don't deserve his hand on my life. He said, yeah, that's the reason why I'm giving it to you. And then the fourth one. This is a grand crescendo. What does he provide for us? Huh. Well, it's a hard time branding this last one, so I, I just call it this. He gives us this fourth reality. Merciful goodness. Merciful goodness. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now, pay attention to that. You would naturally think that goodness and mercy would go before you. No. He says, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Why does he say follow me? Because the shepherd is perfect and I'm imperfect. His goodness and mercy shall follow me. Let me give you a silly illustration here. We, we as was shared, we, we have 11 grandchildren. And I, uh, we, we were in a meeting with the door holders before the service. And uh, someone asked, uh, uh, she'd ask, well, what's your favorite Christmas tradition? And I started to say, but I'm afraid it's going to get back to my wife. I'll say it here, and it definitely will get back to her. But I started to say my wife's favorite Christmas tradition is to spend more on the grandchildren every Christmas than she did last time. And uh, <laughs> so that's, but uh, um, we've got 11 grandkids, and when they, were, when they were small, when they were small, we used to have this thing called Mimi and Papa Camp. And, uh, and I'd have to take extra vitamins and all of that stuff when... <laughs> They were coming to meet me in Papa Camp, right? I mean, you know, there's a reason why young folks have babies. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, so, my, but my wife, she is, uh, she's sister organized and this kind of thing. And so we'd have them for a weekend, you know, you'd be, go to the parks and the zoos and all that, all that stuff. And, and uh, so, you know, they, they were like two, three, four, five years old. And, and, uh, and you know, it was bedtime, she would, uh, my job was to clean up after them. And how, how, I don't know how a two, three, four year old can tear up a house. I mean, it's like, they're just awful. <laughs> just destruction. And so she would, she would be taking them upstairs to go get their baths and this kind of thing. And then I, the greatest product in the world is this Mr. Clean Eraser thing. Man, man, that stuff is good stuff, Jack. I'm telling you. And so I, I, you know, I'd get a box of Mr. Clean erasers, and you know, and I, I they, they, you know, put spaghetti hands all in the walls, and they, 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 then they, they would draw on the walls. One of them had this habit of drawing on the wall. I say, Quentin, man, why? I tell you, to draw on the wall. So, but Papa, you got pictures on the wall. I want my picture on the wall. I said, all right, I'll put a frame around what you just put. Right. <laughs> so, you know, and so they'd go upstairs, and I'm just kind of. Erasing, erasing, erasing. What makes you right is not that you're right, is that he is right, and you're dependent on his rightness. 
and goodness and mercy cleans up after you. And that's what David said, all the days of my life. Now, this is not permission to sin. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is Yahweh your shepherd? Fast forward. This is shades, shadows, forecasting. John chapter 10, where Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And he's laid his life down for all of us. And if you're here this morning, you're not sure that Jesus is living inside of your heart and life. You can be sure right now. You were born to experience his love and forgiveness. Did you know that? You were born to experience his hope, his help, his presence in your life. He's come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He wants to care for you. Why are you fighting him? He wants to love you. Don't reject him. He wants you to be everything that you were born to be. You can't bootstrap that. You see, I, the, the great irony is that, that the path to freedom and release and fullness is dependence. It's surrender saying, I yield to the shepherd. And then the shepherd said, all right, let's rock and roll. I've got this. I've got you. So if you're here today, you don't know for sure that Jesus is living in your heart and life. You can make sure right now. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I turn from my sin. And I receive you as my Savior and Lord. You don't have to beg him. You don't have to plead bargain with him. Jesus died once for all. And he will receive you. But maybe, please forgive me, you are a follower. But you've gotten a little stubborn and hard-headed. This self-reliant thing is messing you up. And you keep making one bad choice and decision after another. And you know better. You know better. But this is thing inside of you. It says, I've got to take the reins. As I used to say to my kids, experience is not always the best teacher, but it is the only school a fool will attend. And we often turn to God when our foundations are shaking. Ironically, only to realize that it's God who's shaking them. Things ain't working out because you're trying to make them work out apart from him. And he said, Will, will, will you let me, Yahweh, be your shepherd? Will you say, I yield? I'm going to stop telling you what to do with my life. It's your life. I'm going to stop telling you how to use me. I want to respond to you. God, forgive me of my stubbornness.